Uh, Marshall adesso ci parlerà in di, di tante cose, in particolare di un, di un problema che si chiama punizione. Sentirete cosa da dire. Vi faccio un comunicato. Alain Parguè, io sono andato da lui con un, uh, un documento e gli ho detto senti Alain, per favore puoi nominarli questi politici italiani? Cosa che lui prima non ha fatto perché era molto concentrato sulla sua voglia di finire la relazione e dietro sua responsabilità diretta, e naturalmente anche la mia perché l'ho già scritto, Alain Parguet ha eh, citato questi politici italiani come particolarmente corrotti dall'elite tecnocratiche francesi in ordine di importanza, eh, Romano Prodi, Mario Draghi, Carlo Zeglio Ciampi, Padua Schioppa, Mario Monti particolarmente legato alla Chiesa, al Vaticano, e ha detto che il peggiore di tutti, un grande amico personale di Attali, il tecnocrate che disse ma cosa credeva la plebaglia europea che l'euro fosse stato fatto per la loro felicità, si chiama Massimo D'Alema. Parole di Parguet. Uh, I will also have something to say about uh, Signore Monte and Draghi during the speech. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> Before I do that, I want to make an important uh, clarification on something that's already been discussed a few times today. This is something that came up uh, during lunch, which Paolo discussed with me. And this is the uh, subject we'll be discussing, I'll be discussing with Stephanie tomorrow, regarding the difference between a user and an issuer of the currency. Countries such as the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, and the United Kingdom all issue their own currency. They have sovereignty in the fullest sense of the word. They can spend with no financing constraints. There may be inflationary constraints, real resource constraints, but there is no inability to pay in a financial sense. That used to be the case for Italy when you had the lira. But now you are a user of a currency. You use other people's money, so to speak. So that means you are dependent on either tax revenues or funding from the capital markets, the bond markets, in order to sustain your growth. So if the bond markets decide that you are bankrupt or insolvent, they can effectively shut you down. They can charge you such a high interest rate that the country can no longer function. That, for example, is the situation in which Greece is in today. And Portugal is coming into that situation as well. Uh, we talked earlier about the steering wheel analogy that Stephanie used in regard to Abalerna. So we in America, we have control of the steering wheel. We don't often act like we do, but we have total control over the steering wheel. And unfortunately, you in Italy are passengers in the car. And the bond markets have the steering wheel. And it doesn't matter what kind of car it is. It could be a dumpy little uh, Ford, or it could be a fancy Ferrari. But if you don't have control of the steering wheel, you can't drive the car. So I think it's very important to clarify that point. But we'll discuss that more tomorrow. The other thing I'd like to discuss this afternoon is this disturbing trend 
I see amongst my Italian friends who continue to blame themselves for the current crisis that they, in which they find themselves. There is a sense that somehow you have become lazy profligates and that you've been the brats of the European Union and that therefore you deserve to be punished. Well, I'm here to absolve you of your sins, even though I'm not a priest. <laughs> I'm going to uh, discuss a variation on an old Greek fable about uh, the industrial ants and the profligate grasshopper. You probably know the traditional story. Uh, over the past two years in particular, the Greeks have earned an international reputation as Europe's grasshoppers and the Germans have become the ants. Unfortunately, the Greeks' reputation has now spread westward to Portugal, Italy, Spain, and even northwards uh, toward Ireland, as all sorts of non-Greeks are painted with the same brush of being lazy grasshoppers. The bailout packages for Greece uh, have been accompanied by this propaganda that the Eurozone has been divided into a re two regions full of industrious northern ants in Germany, the Netherlands, etc., and lazy southern grasshoppers. So now with the warmth of the Euro summer days behind us, now that the easy money from Wall Street has gone, uh, a winter of discontent has descended upon us allegedly due to the lazy grasshopper's idleness. That's the dominant story you hear in Europe today, that you lazy grasshoppers are knocking on the northern ants' doors, cap in hand, seeking one bailout after another. And, and the ants, understandably, are coy, and they say, yeah, we'll give you more money, if you promise to change your ways. So what they are saying is that the stocks that the ants accumulated for the heavy winter are being endangered by these hungry, careless, lazy grasshoppers who resist changing their profligate ways. I'm sure you've all heard this story over the last year. Now the problem uh, with attractive stories like this is that they can distort as much as they can help. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to argue that uh, Aesop's fable, as attractive as it might be, uh, contributes more to Europe's problem than it does the solution. And my reason for this is simple. The ants and grasshoppers are found in all areas, in Greece and Italy, there are hard-working, industrious people, just as there are lazy, profligate grasshoppers in Germany and in the Netherlands and in Austria. But we have tended to assume that all the ants are in the north and all the grasshoppers are in the south, and therefore we're introducing toxic remedies to rectify the problem. It is true that the crisis has placed a disproportionate share of the burden on the back of Europe's ants. But the ants are not exclusively German, Dutch or Austrian, nor are the grasshoppers exclusively Greek, Italian or Spanish. Some ants are German and some are Italian. What unites all of Europe's ants, north and south, east and west, is that they have worked very hard, struggling to make ends meet during the good times, and are struggling even more during the bad times. Meanwhile, the grasshoppers, otherwise known as bankers or technocrats, both in the north and the south of Europe, have lived the good life before the crisis and are still doing well today. They are keen, as always, to privatize any gains they have and socialize the losses. And they socialize the losses by distributing on the hardworking ants.
No. As I said, you've been told that you're a bunch of lazy grasshoppers. You've been told that you're a nation of tax cheats, profligates, living beyond your means. Those have been the charges. We hear them all the time. That's the narrative that has taken hold over the last couple of years. And that's what the Germans in particular continue to propagate. And they have been so successful that even in this great, proud nation, many people believe it. You have this very weird idea that you've been bad and you deserve to be punished. It's like a form of Stockholm Syndrome, or I guess we could call it Berlin Syndrome in this case. <laughs> Well, it's not true. And the sooner we understand this fact, the quicker will be the possibility of a proper set of reforms which will help ants everywhere and where we can stop bailing out the interests of corrupt bankers and EU technocrats who are totally insulated from the realities of day-to-day -day life in Italy and other parts of the European Union. In Italy, just as in Germany, you have many hard-working people in many instances, as Alain was saying earlier, they hold two jobs, but have, have traditionally found it very hard to make ends meet due to low wages, exploitative working conditions, and a rate of inflation for their lowly basket of goods, which is much above the official average, especially after the Euro's introduction boosted food and basic goods prices. Because of this, they took on more debt. They faced massive pressure from the banks to take out loans in order to provide for their children that the, those things that the TV tells them no child should be without and which those with a meager income cannot really afford. Now come the crisis, a number of members of these families lost their jobs. Many of you lost part of your earnings. Bank loans were called in taxes rose, and in some instances people have had to contemplate living without electricity because the state is trying to squeeze more tax out of them and they can't afford it. So these families' prospects have collapsed. Yet somehow they are being painted as the villains of the peace and the source of the problems of the euro. Now in Germany we also have ants, as I've said before. We have hard-working people who make products that uh, many people enjoy, but they have workers who have had stagnant wages. They also have struggled to make ends meet before and after the Eurozone crisis. Their increasingly productive labor and stagnant wages has meant that there's been a huge transfer of capital from workers to the manufacturers. Profits in Germany have skyrocketed over the last few years, and these have been converted into surpluses whose size grew largely due to the redistribution of income away from the German ants towards their employers and partly because of the country's great, greater next exports which accelerated the cheap German labor that Germany was becoming. So once created, uh, these surpluses, these trade surpluses began to seek higher returns elsewhere due to the low interest rates that they produced in Germany. At this point, the German grasshoppers, these uh, bankers whose aim it was to maximize gain out of the short uh, run out of zero effort, looked south for a good deal. They turned their attention to Greece, they turned their attention to Italy, uh, they turned their attention to Portugal and Ireland. Now, we were all at this point in the uh, common currency area, but there was still the, prof uh, the prospect for a d interest rate arbitrage, especially in the areas of personal cre and credit card loans. So you had German capital produced by the manufacturer's hard, cheap labor and directed by the irresponsible German grasshoppers flowed south in search of higher returns. So what happens when money floods in unexpectedly? Well, you get bubbles. It's that simple. In Spain, this took the form of a real estate bubble. 
In Greece, uh, the bubble manifested itself in the form of public debt, as the Greece grasshoppers, otherwise known as Greek property developers, found it easier to grab the German capital flows via the accounts of the state, and whose administrators were only keen to shower the Greek grasshoppers with procurement contracts. So, the precise form of the southern bubbles does not matter. They would burst anyway once the larger bubbles created by our uber grasshoppers on Wall Street popped. What does matter is that the German ants could see that their hard work was not translating into a better life, but into more drudgery and less purchasing power. Now, come the crisis, the German ants in particular were told that they must tighten their belts again at a time when they were falling deeper into a poverty trap. They were told that their government was sending millions, trillions to the so-called pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain, who these Germans assume were the lazy grasshoppers. Since they were never told that the Greek or Spanish or Italian governments are not allowed to use this money to revive growth, but simply to bail out the banks, in fact, the loans were given on the condition that the blow against the ants would be maximized so as to minimize the pain of the grasshoppers, they were very puzzled. Why, they asked, are we working harder than ever and taking home less money? Why does our government keep sending money to these so-called lazy profligates and not to us? Meanwhile, here in Italy and in Greece and in Portugal, hardworking people like yourselves remain both desperate and also angry. The grasshoppers of these countries, these would include, as I said, the bankers, and the so-called technocrats, uh, such as uh, Signor Monte and Draghi, pointed the finger at them and called them all sorts of names. They joined in the narrative. In fact, just in yesterday's American Wall Street Journal, Mr. Draghi launched an extraordinary attack on the welfare state. He suggested that it was and remains the source of today's problems in the Eurozone. So we've had a complete change in the narrative. No longer, as was the case after 2008, was it uh, the reckless lending practices of the banks, their creation of crazy nuclear-style products such as credit default swaps, which caused the crisis. Thanks to people like Mr. Draghi, Mrs. Mer Mrs. Merkel, and Signor Monti, the, virtually all of the so-called leading experts in the West now claim that the crisis was a product of public profligacy, and that your failure to address this so-called problem would bring down civilization as we know it. Now, you're probably all scratching your heads, thinking, well, there must be a mistake because you've never really enjoyed any of the good times the way your banker friends have. You have uh, struggled before and you are struggling now admittedly far more desperately. As for the bailouts, you and your neighbors across the Adriatic in Greece can't see them. Nobody tells you that the trillions end up in Europe's insolvent banks where they fall into a bottomless black pit. And then you have the added insult to injury where you have the Germans calling you thieves, corrupts, spendthrifts, overreachers. It's hard not to reach into the collective memory for moments in history that make it so easy to become anti-German. Now, when the euro was established, there was a very interesting experiment that took place simultaneously 
in both Greece and the periphery. In Germany, governments, employers and trade unions all tried to restore German competitiveness, they claimed, employment and growth by reducing German wages and just squeezing German inflation below the European average. Meanwhile, in countries like Greece, Italy, Spain and Ireland, the governments of that time struggled to prepare the country for accession to the Eurozone by also squeezing real wages and taking advantage of the influx of immigrants into the country to drive them down even further. Now here in Italy there was another interesting wrinkle. And there's been a very good paper written about this by one of your compatriots, Professor Gustavo Piga. You, your public accounts were doctored, they were understated through the use of a number of Wall Street derivatives which mask the true size of Italy's public debt. I hasten to add that the use of these products was approved by both Eurostat and by Italy's Treasury at the time. And guess who was the senior official in charge of debt management at the Treasury at this time? I'm sure you already know, but I'll, I'll uh, eliminate the mystery. That's right, it was Mario Draghi who subsequently moved to Goldman Sachs, where he helped earn fees for the bank by helping to privatize Italy's national assets. Nice work if you can get it. Now, in Germany, the experiment to reduce workers' benefits by the so-called Hartz Reform, named after the former head of Volkswagen, worked extremely well and kept working after the euro was created. Real wages for workers fell and fell and fell. Unemployment was slashed, but workers earned less and they couldn't buy their own output from the gleaming factories that produced more and more for less and less. German goods flooded uh, the other European markets and at the same time, Germany's success caused money to become even cheaper, flooding the so-called surrounding Eurozone countries, including Greece, Italy, Spain, Ireland. And you use that cheap money to buy more German goods. In other words, your so-called profligacy helped to sustain Germany's massive trade surplus which allowed them to run smaller fiscal deficits. But Germany's ants worked harder for less, while Germany's own grasshoppers laughed all the way to their bank. And for a time, this appeared to work well. Um, uh, once the flood of cheap money from outside, from Germany and from Wall Street, allowed the Italians, the Spanish and the Greeks and the Portuguese and their political allies in government to borrow from the Germans, they did so as if there was no tomorrow. Who could blame them? If you're offered incredibly cheap credit, the temptation becomes overwhelming. The only problem was that every time the Italian or the Greek or the Portuguese ants asked for some of the, being, the benefits of being in the Euro, they were either paid off with more cheapskate public sector jobs, paid with borrowed money, or they were told to go to the banks and borrow directly to sustain their lifestyles. This was done on the back of European structural funds and tides of borrowed monies. The Italian grasshoppers, in alliance with some of the German ones, got fatter and fatter, while hardworking ants such as yourselves continued to struggle to make ends meet. And then, of course, Wall Street collapsed in 2008. When the collapse occurred across the Atlantic, it hit the banks first, and then the Eurozone's public finances later. I think it's important to recognize that. The banks were hit first. This crisis was not caused by excessive government spending. So, of course, when the funding dried up, 
the bond markets began to question the solvency of the various states who use the euro. In the first instance, it was Greece. We're told that this is a one-off, that they have been saved. But the reality is that the speculative forces of capital are now heading towards Lisbon. And after they take care of Lisbon, they will soon go to Spain and Italy. The euro was not supposed to work like this. But someone had to be blamed because you can't own up to a colossal failure like this. Too many people like Signor Monti and Signor Draghi are invested with the success of the euro. They couldn't possibly admit that they were wrong. So they all found it convenient to fall back on the scoundrel's last refuge, nationalism. Suddenly, we have a war of words between Greeks and Germans, Northerners and the Southerners. We're now told that nobody was ever bailed out except for some lazy, grasping people, and the, the deeds of the banks are completely ignored. Now, as you know, all of Aesop's fables have a moral. Uh, many like to think of Aesop's parable as a morality tale whose purpose was simply to warn against sloth, laziness, and an unhealthy disregard for the future. But it was more than that. Aesop was also sounding the alarm against both spent, the grasshopper spendthrift ways and the ants' extreme parsimony. Today, there is another wrinkle that needs to be added to his moral. And that is when, that when the ants and the grasshoppers are distributed across the division, separating surplus from deficit nations within a badly designed monetary system, the stage is set for a depression that sets all against each other in a vicious spiral from which only losers can emerge. So our only option is that we have to start to subvert this dominant narrative. We have to recognize the coexistence of neglected ants in both Italy and Germany, and also recognize that there are over-pampered grasshoppers in both Germany and Italy. If we start recognizing that, that is a good beginning. Then we can start working towards a system that promotes growth and employment, not perpetual bailouts for banks. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much.